Thank you all for joining us. I will continue to admit people as they um, show up. It, I know we did have about 10 more, 10, 10 or 12 more people that were registered for today. So, but we will move forward. Okay, so thank you so much for joining us today. For those of you that don't know me, I am Katie Eaton. I'm the president here at the Michigan City Chamber of Commerce. And um, looking a little different this year, we've done legislative briefings for a number of years, usually in partnership with uh, the Laporte Chamber, the CVB, sometimes Westville Chamber, other organizations throughout the county, and we do them um, in larger groups, and it's usually a breakfast. Obviously, with the pandemic going on, this looks a little different. We wanted to make sure that we had some conversations with our local elected officials. So joining us today, we have House Representative Pat Boy and State Senator Karen Tallian. Um, and we will, uh, I, I'm going to start with Karen because I know that she has another thing to get here today, but what will happen is they will both give us kind of a rundown on things that they're working on, things that they're keeping an eye on, um, craziness that might be happening in the state house this year. It's been a very active session. Uh, I know here at the chamber we've had quite a few conversations of just some of the hot topics that are happening, so we'll definitely get to those if they don't come up in their presentations. Uh, but State Senator Karen Tallian has served in the Indiana State Senate since December 2005 when she was elected to fulfill an unexpired term. Tallian was re-elected in 2006, 2010, 2014, and 2018. She represents Senate District 4, which includes portions of Porter and LaPorte counties and previously included portions of Lake County. She is a graduate of University of Chicago with a bachelor's degree in philosophy and psychology, the Senator's postgraduate work includes an associate's degree from Chicago's Harrington Institute of Design. She graduated magna cum laude from Valparaiso University School of Law, and uh, she lives in the Portage area. So at this time, I am going to turn it over to Senator Tallian to give us some updates on things that she's working on. She was briefly mentioning some amendments that she's reading through today, and I know she's got a very busy schedule. So happy to have you join us today. Thank you so much. Um, Senator Tallian. Well, thank you. Thanks for, and thanks for doing these. Um, you know, it's been very difficult to uh, have our usual little town hall meetings and uh, all those things that we normally do. I'm going to end up doing one uh, later in March. Uh, it will also be by Zoom because uh, people are just not happy with going out. Um, so, yeah, I want to tell you this, this. This is a terrible year. In the, in the state house. Um, there are so many things going on and so many really wild, radical things going on. And I think part of it, uh, it is exacerbated by the fact that uh, people know, legislators who want to get through some of the stuff know that they're not going to have the crowds of people, the hordes of demonstrators that, you know, people, um, actively coming to the state house and objecting to things. And so it's been easier to get through some of these of these things. Um, so I am sure that at least several of you are aware of uh, a couple of the environmental bills that are going on. Um, of course, I'm not, you know, going to get a hearing on the coal ash bill. Instead, what our environmental committee has done uh, last uh, couple weeks ago, we uh, they passed a bill out of there that basically deregulated all of Indiana's wetlands. Um, it was horrible. Tomorrow, or Monday, we have another one that's basically going to take away uh, a citizen's right to sue any industrial or farm operation or logging operation uh, for any nuisance that might happen to your property to your property. Um, it, it, it's a terrible bill. Uh, it gets away with, you know, basically does away with personal property rights against somebody. If they happen to have a permit for something, you can't sue them. Uh, another crazy thing that seems to be going on down there is this constant battle that the legislature has uh, about Indianapolis. Pretty soon, they're going to turn Indianapolis into what Washington, D.C. used to be. Um, obviously, Indianapolis has its own city county council, which is Democrat. But we have two or three people 
uh, from Republicans from Indy who used to be on the county council, got nowhere, and so came to the legislature. And because there's a Republican supermajority, they're trying to undo everything that goes on in the city county council. We're, we're trying to, uh, you know, they've got bills to redesign bus lines and take away uh, the control of the police department, give it to the governor. Um, it, the list just goes on and on, trying to get rid of uh, the control of the uh, uh, Marion County prosecutor who refuses to prosecute small marijuana crimes. Um, I'm telling you this particular issue, we've probably had 10 bills um, just in the Senate side on things having to do with control of Indianapolis. Uh, and I've got a whole bunch of them again next week. It just consumes huge amounts of our time. Um, and speaking of local control, uh, there are also, a, a, I don't know, a dozen bills that take control of all kinds of things out of the hands of local government. Um, they're basically preempting local government from doing any kind of regulations on, on apartment buildings and landlord tenant issues, uh, on, on controlling the police department and trying to give the, uh, take away all control from the legislator legislative branch of city town government and basically hand it to whoever they hire as the police chief. Um, it, it's going on and on. And like I said before, uh, you know, we have all these committees that are set for next week and all of the, so which means that on Friday, I have to get all these bills and, um, and look at them and have all of my amendment proposals in today, uh, which is why Friday, this is the life of a legislator, right, Pat? Uh, you know, it, it's an incredible amount of work to this time because, um, because there are so many terrible bills. Now, having said all that, I want to tell you about uh, my, this one week, I've had a pretty successful week. Um, I've had three bills heard this week. One of them is workers' compensation. Um, we have not raised our workers' compensation uh, benefits schedule since 2013. So we're several years behind. Um, I finally, I got that through the Pensions and Labor Committee this week. Uh, I also had another big package that I was working with the Indiana Prosecutor or Public Defenders Association, uh, and it's a juvenile justice package, and it reforms a whole number of things. Uh, I had eight items. I got to hear three of them, but they were big. One of them has to do with expunging juvenile records. Um, you know, when they're let out of the system. Uh, because right now, you know, poor kids don't have a, the ability to hire attorneys to do this. Uh, would make some of that automatic. The other thing uh, that it does is to uh, set up a whole bunch of rules uh, uh, involving having kids in adult jails. If we don't do that, we will lose millions of dollars in federal grant money. So that's going through. And the third part of that bill is that uh, uh, we don't have any standards for how a juvenile is determined to be competent. Um, so we wrote those, uh, we put them in statute. And another thing I slipped in, which I never thought I would get, but I just threw it in and and the committee voted for it, is to, be, is to say that any child under the age of 11 is automatically deemed to be incompetent. Uh, I got some fight about it, but a whole bunch of members of that committee agreed. Um, and my third, uh, my third bill uh, has to do with landlord 
tenant and evictions. Um, you, I don't know if you know this, but uh, the last stimulus package, um, we're getting $450 million to the state of Indiana to use for housing and utility assistance. This is a really important program um, because it will allow tenants and to get up to 12 months. They can go arrearage or forward of rental assistance. The money can also be used for utility assistance. Uh, so, you know, basic your basic utilities doesn't include broadband, but it's everything else. Um, and we're trying to figure out uh, how to get all of these people to apply for the money. Um, the, the landlords need the money. You know, a lot of our local, you know, smaller mom and pop kind of landlords uh, have a mortgage to pay. And if they're not getting rent, um, they can't pay. So the whole idea is to get the money flowing. We increased the limit on small claims jurisdiction. Uh, used to be $8,000, but for these mortgage evictions, uh, we're bumping it up. And then, um, and then we are, um, I'm trying not to read the chat until I'm done. Uh, and then we are also uh, setting up with the Supreme Court a uh, settlement conference kind of thing where uh, an attorney would, you'd get on with an attorney, the landlord and the tenant, and they would kind of explain rights and try to get as many people as possible into that money pool and keep them out of court. So that's what we're doing right now. Um, in about a week or two, I expect, well, a couple of weeks, uh, the um, budget will come over from the House that will give us a whole new set of things that we have to talk about. But uh, I'll pass now and, um, and hand it over to Pat. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, we will get to uh, some of those questions in the chat. Um, as a reminder to everyone, if you have specific questions about something, you can add those in the chat and we'll definitely have time at the end to um, get through those things. So, uh, State Representative Pat Boy was first elected to the Indiana House of Representatives um, in November of 2018. Um, her parents had stressed education and hard work and the fact that if one can read well, one can achieve anything. Education is never wasted. Pat attended college with a state scholarship based on grades and needs. She worked all through college to pay for books and supplement her tuition. She earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in English. Pat has been a union worker herself as well as a manager. She was also a small business owner for nearly 30 years. Pat and her husband operated a secretarial data management business in their home from 1988 until just after his death in 2016. Um, her experience includes budget, economic development, community development, and labor negotiations. Uh, she has worked with both Democrats and Republicans as a member of the Better Government Study Group, which hosts educational forums on government in LaPorte County. Pat also served for, on a nonprofit board for many years as a representative to the Drug Free Partnership. Pat, we'll turn it over to you. Good morning, everybody. Thanks, Karen, for all you did. I haven't gotten anything heard in committee. Um, it's, it's very frustrating this year, very frustrating because the committee chairs control everything and they are all Republicans and they listen to their leadership on what they're gonna hear. I did have an opportunity at one point to have my bill on um, coal ash heard in committee and Representative Gutman was really kind of interested in it and then he kind of went downhill on it and he said, leadership doesn't want me to hear this bill. I said, why not? They said, we don't have enough information on it. Okay, well, I'm inundating him with as much information as I can find, but I don't know if it's going to get anywhere. So I'm going to um, push to see if I can get a summer study committee on it. He didn't want to do that either, but he was also under the impression that what they told him was a, the, com the commission is looking at it. Um, he couldn't tell me what that commission was. It's not the IURC and it's not IDEM because IDEM has said specifically they are not gonna make a rule on coal ash. 
So we need to do it, but it's not getting anywhere. It's very frustrating. Um, I got an another letter today from Beverly Shores. Beverly Shores is stuck between the Bailey coal ash sites and the Nip Michigan City coal ash sites. Um, it's like right in between them. And they're, they've got 25 feet of coal ash in the ground at Bailey. And in Michigan City, I think it's deeper than that, although they do have some lined ponds. But they're all over the state, there are places that have coal ash ponds that are right next to water or in a hundred year floodplain. And it'll poison our water. Uh, right now, I have a filter in my apartment. I bought a filter pitcher because the water tastes so bad here. And it comes from the White River, which is right alongside the Harding site for um, their coal ash ponds. And it's just scary that the arsenic and the thallium and the radium and everything else that's in coal ash will go in our water. Um, I'm very passionate about this one. I did have a lot of other bills. I had one for um, uh, minimum wage. I wanted to increase it a, a step at a time to eight eight dollars and twenty five cents in. 2022, $9.15, uh, 20 cents in 2023, and, and $10.15 in 2024, and increase the tipped wages as they went along as well. Um, and also to um, limit the number of people who can get the sub minimum wage, which is usually used for um, disabled. Um, people and um, sheltered workshops and things like that. But if somebody works in one of those and they get a sub-minimum wage and have to go home and pay rent and stuff because they don't have support, uh, they need to have more than sub-minimum wage. Uh, I was contacted about that from um, a group that works with them. Um, misclassification of workers uh, for, um, unemployment taxes. Uh, a lot of times people are classified as uh, contract, not contract workers, um, independent, independent contractors, and they're really employees, at least according to the state. But if they're misclassified that they don't pay into the Workers' on, uh, Compensation Act. Um, I had a green, greenhouse gas inventory program bill to allow um, counties and, um, and jurisdictions that had um, less than 100,000 in um, uh, population um, to get money for, it was, I think it was, I don't remember the numbers. It was like $20,000 for that or, 200, or for 200,000 it was um, double that. But a greenhouse gas emissions inventory can be done by a, an intern from Indiana, Indiana University. Uh, Michigan City had one done, Bloomingham had one done, I don't know who else has. It's really not very expensive and to have a program for all 92 counties would not be expensive, but it didn't get heard. I had a vote by mail bill, which I did last year and it's still not gonna get heard. I had a, a bill on bias motivi motivated crimes just to increase the, the possible penalties when it's been proven that it was created, that it was um, committed by bias after it's been decided that it was a crime. Um, it didn't get heard. I had a clean energy technology training bill that I really wanted to get going and uh, that didn't get heard. I had to notice environmental contamination, which I did last year, just so that people are aware when somebody think something has been spilled in the water near them so that they don't go in the water or use the fish. That didn't get heard again. And I had one on teacher salaries. This time, last year I did uh, asking for a two to 5% raise. This year I asked for a two to 5% raise. And if they did not give their teachers a raise, they would not get the supplemental amount that's in the budget because um, they have two different funds that they get money from. Uh, it, that didn't get hurt either. It's very frustrating 
Karen knows all about this. <laughs> we have passed some bills that sound like they're pretty good. Yesterday, we passed one on sudden cardiac arrest of students um, that they need to be evaluated before they can go back in the game or they don't go back in the game. Um, uh, influ influenza immunizations that they can be offered in hospitals when you have somebody in the hospital if they have some, haven't already had one. There were, um, that well, that one's not passed yet, and neither is the sudden cardiac arrest. Those are on second reading. The ones we read yesterday that were reasonably good, uh, electric vehicles and advanced technology preparing for um, electric technology so that there can be chargers and things like that for cars because a lot of automotive plants now are switching over to producing electric vehicles. Some of them by 2030 are going to produce only electric vehicles. So we need to get ahead of the game. Um, elements of rape. They, not, they didn't actually define consent, but they kind of explained what consent is. Uh, because before, if they said that um, if someone said that they said no, uh, that didn't mean anything. Now if they do, it does mean something. Um, we did some on courts, on juvenile court jurisdiction. I'm not going to try to explain those right now because they're long and involved. Um, Medicaid reimbursement for children's hospitals was a big one. We tried to do that. Um, we wanted to do it last year. We went to um, Chicago, University of Chicago Children's Hospital, and they have, they take people from anywhere. They get a lot of people from Northwest Indiana, but Medicare, uh, Medicaid does not reimburse them as much as they reimburse in Indiana. So if people live in Gary or in Hammond or any place that's really close to Chicago, a 20 minute train ride, have to go to Riley, which is a two and a half to three hour drive from there if they have a car. Um, so they finally got um, an okay after a lot of work. Uh, that was by Representative Slager and Soliday. Um, but I think Karen, Carolyn Jackson was on the um, co-author. They, they finally got that passed. So now that uh, people go to, um, if they take their kids to Chicago, they get re they the hospital gets reimbursed for what they're actually using. Um, they're working on an all claim all payer claims database, so they can keep track of um, billing costs for hospitals and nursing homes and things like that. Um, electric utility reliability reliability adequacy measures. Uh, metrics, a measurement to make sure that when we do start using solar and wind power that we do have adequate backup for when we don't have enough power. And um, it's, not, it, it's regulated by an organization called MISO, which is what he called a stock exchange for, for um, utilities. It's when you have not enough power in one area, they reroute it for you. And if you have too much, they reroute it someplace else where they need it. It's, it's a very complex system. Um, and now they ad allow adoption pet petitions to be filed in any county if there's no objection from parents or everything has been settled. Uh, we voted down the civil immunity related to COVID-19 and SB. Well, we didn't vote it down. I voted against it. They approved it. They also approved HB 1002. Uh, uh, two weeks ago, I think it was. Um, and I didn't vote for it because they do not cover um, standard of care issues in nursing homes and long-term care facilities. There have been some really bad horror stories of people who have died and who have been left alone for, for days in nursing homes and they're blaming it on COVID because they don't have enough staff but they never had enough staff before COVID. So now it's just that much worse. Um, it's supposed to relieve businesses from lawsuits that are brought because someone has received, uh, re 
suffered COVID because of it. But in a nursing home, they don't have a choice. They have to be there. So they should be, um, they need to be protected. There was a, a story that one of the t um, reps told yesterday about a person who had fallen out of bed. He died on the floor because nobody checked on him for more than a day. Um, I had a letter from a woman who had gone in because she needed nursing care from a knee injury. And she ended up with a scalp infection and bed sores because nobody tended to her. Nobody did anything about it. And when they had to take her out of the nursing home, the, par the, the, the daughter and her husband said, you know, we have to take her. We have to put her in the hospital. And they, they made them sign a document that said that they were removing them against medical orders, which is just ridiculous. And the fear is that with not, not specifying nursing homes, as it came over from the Senate, um, people will have a really difficult time because they have to prove gross negligence and or willful misconduct rather than just violating standard of care and, you know, People make mistakes and people miss things, but it's we have lost 5,000 people in nursing homes since COVID started, and it's not all because of COVID. It's kind of sad. Uh, that's just that was just yesterday. <laughs> we have heard. Um, hang on, I've got my lists here. Maybe while you're looking at that, um, there's a lot of discussion in the chat, and maybe I'll give uh, Senator Tully oh. an opportunity to talk about um, Good idea. some of the stuff around um, the housing. You had listed that there was some information that might be coming out from the governor's office. If you could maybe just recap that, Senator uh, Yeah, well, let me say two things. I want to follow up on what Pat said sure. about that, uh, that those Illinois hospital, uh, the Medicaid charges. Um, I have been working on that for about a year and a half, uh, even before, you know, when, before Hal Slager got reelected, uh, I've been putting that bill together with some of the people from U of C Hospital. Um, and then we got the bill together this year. We started one in the Senate. We started uh, basically the same bill in the House. Uh, the House bill got through, is coming over to the Senate. Uh, and I just want to tell everybody um, some, some uh, other piece of news. Uh, I don't know if you all know this, but but Mercy Hospital on the south side of of uh, Chicago, you know, it's like southeast side, uh, just filed for bankruptcy. They're going to close, and so it's going to be even more important uh, that that we get have access to those south side of you know South Chicago hospitals. So this, this is uh, a really important issue. Yeah, let me talk about the, about the money. And I'll get into some more details about that. $450 million is coming uh, to IHCDA. Now, some cities, there are six cities that are gonna have their very own programs with their very own set of money. So Fort Wayne, St. Joe, uh, uh, St. Joe, South Bend, Indianapolis, Lake County, uh, and then maybe Evansville, and there's one more. Uh, they will have their own programs, but all the rest of, the, of this money will go through IHCDA. Um, the, they have some of that money is allocated to uh, operations, and they are doing a huge re reach out program. They're going through township trustees, churches, not-for-profits, uh, attorneys, everybody to get out the word on, or, and, and the Realtors Association, the uh, Association of Apartment Owners or something, and they're trying to get out all of this information. The tenant has to qualify. So the tenant has to either have lost wages, been on unemployment, had COVID medical expenses, so they want, but once they qualify, they're eligible for up to 12 months of rent and utility bills. So, uh, and this can be for a rearage or going forward, but they just have to show that they've got these qualifications. 
um, it, it's gonna it's gonna take some processing, and we hope that people can can kind of hold on. Uh, I even have support on this from the Indiana Bankers Association, who you know they they receive money on the back end from the landlords, right? Who have to pay their mortgages. So uh, we are trying to do whatever we can to get out this money. It's a lot of money and it has to be committed and spent. Well, it has to be committed by the end of September and it has to be spent by the end of this year. Uh, we've got what, seven months to, or now I guess it's 12, 10. We've got 10 months to spend $450 million. Uh, so we gotta get busy. Thank you for that. Can um, I just ask you a quick follow-up on that? Um, so I haven't heard anything about that locally. And I'm, so I'm wondering, uh, you know, is who is, anyway, Deb, idea tell who you locally why. is doing? I'll, I'll okay. tell you why. Um, the money just was allocated, like, you know, in December. And the feds have just now gotten out all of their, quote, guidance, which means all of their rules and regs about who's eligible and who's not. IHCDA just got all of that information in the past like 10 days. And so uh, it, it's gonna be out there. It's coming. Yeah, the township trustees would be, will play a big role in that yes. portion. Um, I know we do uh, county calls with many of the township trustees around, well, we've been doing them through the whole pandemic and, and they are very aware and, and staying up to date on what's going on and they would be a good contact. Right. Um, for those neighborhoods for sure. So um, I want to go back and talk a little bit about some of the things that we've had questions about just from a business standpoint. Obviously the wetlands um, topic that had come up and where that stands. And then also uh, maybe this is more for Pat, but what was, you know, the notice of contamination seems like a, a pretty easy thing. Like if there's contamination and you're within a certain mileage of that contamination, you should be notified. Um, what's the pushback on on that and why, why did it, why do you think it didn't move forward? Um, last year when I, when I introduced it, I had actual penalties in it. Um, and it got a lot of attention, but it also got a lot of negative attention because there were penalties. Penalty. This year I proposed it with IDEM setting the penalties if they're going to be any, so that it wasn't left up to the, this, the, um, and it still didn't go anywhere. We didn't even hear it this time, even though I told them it's, you know, it's really lowered. Yeah. It's just, it's, they don't want to do it. They just don't want to make any changes. And I'm going to try it again next year because I have to do it because people need to know if there's something in the water they're drinking. Yeah. That's not supposed to be there other than what's already in there. Agreed. And then um, the wetlands, I don't know if that was that in the House or was that in the Senate, I'm not sure. That was in the Senate, Senate. and it's coming to the House. Okay. I really don't want to see that. It's a builder's, <laughs> it's a builder's bill. They want to build where they want to build. It's not that hard to file for permits. And they're really, a, an isolated wetland is just that, it's isolated, but it's still connected to the water sources in our communities because it's um, frequently a water sink. Uh, sometimes it's a spring or a seep of water coming up. Sometimes it's just a low place that collects the water, but it goes into our groundwater and it filters it. If it doesn't go there and just, and you build on it, it runs off into rivers and streams directly instead of being filtered. So it's not a good thing. Um, and it's not- Do you wanna make any comments on that one? Uh, yeah. So I have been told repeatedly that, oh, this bill is not going to pass the way it is. It's a shot over the bow at IDEM, and we're not going to let it happen uh, the way it is. Now, having said that, they pushed it through the Senate like a, like a freight train. Um, whether they will, whether there's already some deal uh, to not have it come out of the house that way or to fix it in conference, I don't know. Um, what I was, what I kept saying to them is, look, 
item has been under the control of a Republican governor for 17 years. And if you guys have some problem with the way the item is running or not talking to you, why don't you go talk to them? Because you've got all the ability to do that. Uh, and so there are underlying, underlying this entire session is a whole lot of stuff between the governor and the republic and the, the sort of right wing of the Republican Party. They are, there are all kinds of bills, remember I was telling you, uh, to limit the governor's power, to limit what he can do by executive order, now to, to uh, do something with IDEM. Uh, there are a couple other bills, but there are, there are some schisms in the, in the Republican Party, and I think this is one of them. There definitely are some schisms. When we go into committee, uh, to caucus, it takes us about half an hour. We'll come back on time for the, caucus, for the uh, chamber and twice, instead of 2.30, they came in at four o'clock or later because they were in caucus and they were arguing through the whole thing. There was um, a house bill around um, eliminating some specific licensings for like cosmetology and hairstylists and assistants. Has that, has that died down? Well, we're regulating people who, who put on, or we're deregulating people who apply false eyelashes. <laughs> the most important bill of the Senate. But no, I don't, I don't see, you know, usually if, if we start trying to regulate or deregulate, usually it's about deregulation. They want to take the regulations away and then the cosmetologists come down and they have a fit and, and no, I haven't heard anything about that. Okay. We had um, a couple businesses that were concerned about, you know, the licensing being taken away because they were like, then just anybody's going to be doing some of those skilled jobs. So um, doesn't sound like that maybe is going to go anywhere. So um, we actually had an, a Republican bill fail. I couldn't believe it. It was um, <laughs> it was about publication of notices, and they wanted to make everything go online. Uh, because it's expensive to print on a public notice in a newspaper, but not everybody has broadband, not everybody has an access. If you don't know that it's going to be online, you have to search online every day, which is ridiculous. Um, and it failed by con because it, due to a um, lack of a constitutional majority. It was close, but it failed. That was a good thing. It's it was premature until we have broadband across the state. It's it's crazy. And then I think there still should be some kind of a notice in the newspaper that there will be published on the website a public notice about something. But that's another that's for another time. <laughs> Next session. <laughs> There's a question here about, um, and you kind of brought this up earlier, but um, smaller charges for small possession of marijuana. What does that look like, Karen? It looks the same way as it's looked for the last 10 years. Yeah. yeah. They're not going to move. But I will tell you this. Um, it has been uh, the, their mantra that, oh, as long as this is illegal on the federal level, that it's on Schedule 1, we're not going to do anything in Indiana. Um, it looks like the feds are going to probably delist it from Schedule One drugs, uh, mostly because there are so many, so many states where it's legal now, and the banking laws are all screwed up because of it's on Schedule One, and so uh, I think they're going to take that off, and they're going to um, they're going to delist it, but it's not going to happen this year. Mm -mm. Also on the federal side that may impact some of the state um, is, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about federal uh, minimum wage being changed as well. So then how does that impact some of the legislation that's happening in the states around minimum wage and increasing to that? Um, what are your guys' thoughts on, on that? Well, I've been around the state house for 16 years. 
And I have seen once where the Indiana legislature changed the minimum wage. And that is back in a decade ago, more, when the feds changed it. Um, there are too many people, in, certainly in the Senate Republican Caucus, who don't believe that we should have a minimum wage at all. Mm -hmm. And we never, ever, I, I know Pat has filed them, I filed them, bills for living wage, minimum wage, that never get a hearing. We file them just to keep the, the, the discussion moving, but they never get a hearing. And if the feds do it, then we will do a follow-up bill uh, because we have to change Indiana's law to, to match the feds. But no, it's never gonna happen in Indiana until the feds do something. Okay. Um, I know you have to take off here at right at nine o'clock. So if there's any specific questions for Senator Talian before she leaves, there's a question that came in. Uh, the ability to hold a meeting virtually certainly has a necessity during the pandemic. Do you think the ability to continue virtual meetings will continue um, considering, you know, broadband issues in rural, rural areas? Don't know, probably. We've gotten used to this. Um, and sometimes it's really easier. Uh, I think of some committees that I have where I might have to travel all the way to Indy for an hour and a half meeting and then travel back. Uh, yeah, it would be great during those times to be able to attend virtually. And, and I will also say that on a smaller, for a smaller meeting, uh, it's usually not bad. Um, the virtual testimony in committees now at the state house, however, really stinks. It, it, it's, it's bad. Representative Boyd, have you, any thoughts on, on that? Or um, <coughs> as looking, well? Maybe I'm looking for the number. There is a bill in the house for um, public meetings to be held, uh, but it's for cities and towns and counties, not for the state, um, to, for them to have their virtual meetings. The state is still gonna have public meetings. Right now, the committees meet in one room and the testimony people meet in another room on, on a virtual screen, uh, but you can hear them, you can talk to them, you can ask them questions, they can ask you questions. It's not as bad as it could be, but it's really more difficult now than it used to be. Okay, um, well, any any last thoughts? I know there was some conversation, any, any movement on legislation around housing for the state of Indiana, or um, that's always a hot topic with uh, people in the community. Any, in, you know, incentives for housing development or additional anything? Yeah, take away the wetlands. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> That's, uh, I don't recall seeing anything, okay. but I haven't gotten through all the bills yet either. We've got 500 and something bills in yeah. the house. It's a lot. It's a lot. Um, I'll open it up if there's any other questions. If anybody wants to unmute themselves and go ahead and ask a question or make any comments, um, feel free to do that. Otherwise, uh, if there's any last minute thoughts that you guys would, you know, like to leave us with, you can do that as well. Um, just, you know, thank you guys for doing this uh, and, and setting this up. Um, it takes one more burden off of us to have to set it up and get out all yeah. the information, uh, you know, to everybody. So um, thanks for doing it. And, you know, I suggest you do it again sometime in the middle of the second half. Sure. Yes. Sure. Definitely. Um, yeah, we can definitely set that up. Do you guys want to give out where, where, if anybody wants to get in touch with you about anything, what is the best way for them to reach you? Um, Your website, if they want to send you an email or something like that, just to go. Yeah, to my website, the Senate website. Uh, S, I'm at S, like Senate, Senate 4 at 
uh, in.gov and um, just put my name up on the Google. It'll show up. <laughs> yeah, she's All right. I got to go to the other meeting. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your time today. Bye, really Karen. Bye. And Pat, you're you're the same then. Um, I just put my email in the uh, the, the ones that go through the house email. I see them when they get forwarded to me. Yeah. So this is <laughs> this is my email that I can be contacted at in p uh, paboy50 at gmail .com. All right. All right. Well, thank you again so much for joining us today. And yes, definitely we can set up another time to do this maybe in the second half of the session and um, get some more updates and we'd be happy to do that and get that scheduled. So we can. Okay. Thank you so much for doing this. Yes. Thank you. And thank you everybody for attending. Yes. Have a wonderful Friday and a happy Valentine's Day. Hopefully you can oh, yeah. have some fun with your, with your loved ones this weekend. Oh no, I'll be here in India all the time. <laughs> I don't want to bring COVID home. Yes. Thank you okay. so much. Thank Appreciate you. Bye-bye. Have a great day. You too.